So let's uh, start. Uh, welcome to the uh, Wyndham Select Board meeting for 3 October. It's uh, 6.32. This is a recorded virtual meeting. All uh, votes be by roll call. And present are Gary Cheeseman from the Select Board. Diane Buka. Peter Clay. And uh, let's uh, go right into uh, the slide deck if you're ready. Michelle. All right, we're just having uh, some techno technology uh, difficulties. So, Michelle, if you want to make me uh, the co-host, let me see if I can share from my end. Hi, I did. I made you co-host. Okay, let's try this. All right. How does that look? Full screen? Yes. Looks good. All right. You got it, Diane, Peter? Yes. All right. Looks good. All right. So uh, as usual, let's start off with the uh, public input, if there is, for uh, items from the public comment that are not on the agenda tonight. And uh, I believe we'll have time after all the presentations for uh, further public input on uh, those. So uh, any hands up, Michelle? Patrick Waddell's hand is up. All right. Patrick, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would just ask the select board to listen to your constituents. The select board made our special town meeting much more difficult than it had to be. There were no need for two thirds majorities on any of our votes. There's no need for a ballot vote on article two, except that it's already printed and now we're going to the ballot. There was no need to dictate funding mechanism for the feasibility study. People have been telling you this, but you haven't been listening. So I ask you to please listen to your constituents and I'll leave you with a couple of potential to do's for you. Turn on the Zoom chat, turn it back on. Let us tell you what we're thinking. Focus on what the, the speaker is saying, not the stopwatch, not stopping a person at two minutes, but listen to what is being said at, the, uh, at these meetings. Put the school feasibility study on the list of potential ARPA projects. Don't force us to go to a writing uh, so uh, writing campaign on a survey. The people want it there. Listen to your constituents, please. And take a moment for self-reflection. Ask yourselves, why am I on the select board? Are my decisions for the greater good or are they are personal interest? And I'm not saying personal gain, but personal <laughs> projects. The town is speaking. Please listen. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Anybody else? All right, onward then, uh, please, Michelle. Or uh, Steve, you uh, bring the slides. All right, so Steve, your announcements. All right, um, you know, I just want to announce, I know we've, we've been uh, taking the opportunity every chance we can, but Final announcement, I believe, uh, from at least from the select board before uh, Thursday, October 6th, is the Wenham Master Plan 
uh, community forum open house. It's at the Wenham Museum right next to the town hall. Uh, for any additional, we you know invite everyone to come down again Thursday, October 6, 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, any additional questions or concerns, reach out to Margaret Hoffman, our planner, or you know, feel free to reach out to myself or Michelle. Uh, I'll make sure your questions get answered. Uh, Steve, I, Peter Cloud, just love to add that um, we need as many people as possible to come to this one of Master Plan Community Forum open house. Um, I'm beginning to think that we may have a rep and we may have a state senator there, um, which is always good. Um, so just spread the word as far as you can, please. And we could add also, this is for all ages and the uh, Wyndham Museum has very kindly opened up their 100th anniversary display for those people that uh, come to the uh, forum as well. Um, I wonder, Steve, if I could just mention something. Uh, yeah, of course. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, the It does say it's from 6 to 8 p.m., but it's an open house and you don't have to be there at six o'clock. You can stay as long as you'd like. Um, There'll be two presentations. One happens at 6.30 and one happens at 7.30. It's the same presentation. It's just for whoever's there at 6.30 and then whoever stays for the 7.30. Um, but again, you don't have to be there for the whole two hours. Anytime that you can come in between six and eight would be wonderfully appreciated. Okay. All right, uh, town administrator's update. Just just a couple uh, for this evening. Um, when the budget uh, memo went out today to uh, all the boards, uh, committees, and department heads. Uh, so we're going to start uh, essentially that process. All the templates have been made and distributed. You know, we're going to start the um, the meeting process, internal meeting process, in two weeks. On the, so the first meeting will take place on Monday, October seventeenth. Uh, the slight change to this year's process is we have included uh, boards and committees. So we're going to be reaching out or I'll be reaching out to chairs tomorrow with um, kind of, you know, a template that they can use to help them think ahead for budgetary or expenditure needs coming up in the fiscal year. So kind of, you know, instead of uh, being reactionary and looking for the money when, you know, the money's needed in the fiscal year through other, through other, um, expense line items or try to you know try to try to get some things down on paper and, and plan ahead so we know we have the money squared away for that uh, we had last week we had a meeting essentially the first uh budget kickoff meeting with schools and the chairs of uh the select board of both uh, hamilton and wenham and the chairs of the fincom both hamilton and wenham uh joe the town manager myself and jamie cologne and um and their, uh, their uh, uh, finance director, and along with uh, members from the school committee and Eric Tracy and their finance director on the school side. And it was a good, uh, good meeting. Everybody, um, you know, I think it's a good relationship. Everybody's been open and transparent. So we're looking forward to that process. And that is all I have for you tonight. Thank you. For a cheers report is um, maybe a fun one here. I think uh, quite a few people were out on the 24th of September, uh, that Saturday, for the uh, Children's Business Fair. So uh, thanks to uh, Bethany Davis Swanson and Natalie Bowers, who organized that. But a uh, big success. Uh, participation doubled from 24 booths last year to uh, 60 uh, kids at 48 booths this year. And I'll just uh, run through the winners, if I could, here. So under 12 age group. For a most business potential was Hannah LeBlanc, who did multiple handmade items, including dog toys. Uh, most creative idea was Finn Laporte, who did handmade clay magnets and jewelry. And the uh, spirit of entrepreneurship was Amaris McCready, who uh, did wild and woolly uh, needle felted wool pumpkins. Those are pretty neat. And the 12 and over group um, business potential, Callie Mignon, who uh, did uh, custom wooden signs and trays. Uh, most creative idea, Rumi uh, Korom, who did a unicorn sparkle eco glitter and spirit of entrepreneurship, Luke Wallace, who uh, did uh, drone photography. So quite a wide range of uh, talents there. And I think, uh, Diane, you uh, 
did a little bit of shopping there too. Any comments? <laughs> I did. Very well then, the uh, select board members. Diane, any uh, reports? Do we lose you there, Diane? I don't know. Did I freeze? Uh, so any uh, any reports from you? Oh, I'm sorry. I must have froze. I didn't hear that part. Um, I just wanted to thank the almost 160 people that showed up for the special town meeting. I thought it went very well. Um, different um, than in the past with an appointed special town meeting clerk. That was good. And again, the children's fair was awesome. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of upcoming things with the master plan yeah, on Thursday. We all want to get there. Thanks. People. I did. I all right, someone needs to mute, please. Okay, I was thinking very it good. was in person and then I realized it was virtual. So here I am. Okay. Trick or treat hours. Nope, oh, they were just what are they? Peter. I'm saying, yeah, right? yeah, yeah I, I would like to say something. So last week, um, Eric Mansfield and I went to uh, the North Shore, I'm going to get the name wrong, but the North Shore Water, res water Resilience um, Alliance. Uh, and um, Peter Clay. Eric, uh, who's Ernest? I think you're, you need to mute yourself. Okay. Oh, there you go. And um, so Eric, I think it's going to be on the agenda on, is it late October, Steve? Yeah, I'm pulling up the calendar right now. It's um, the 18th, October 18th. Yeah, and I, it's, it's, it's basically every town signed on um, to try and make things better um, in terms of uh, qual quantity and quality of water and um and bruce's staff has done great things so far and um i mean we're sitting there in the room with the beverly salem water supply board and then people from beverly people people from uh salem it was it was really good i look forward to it, um eric walking you through it sounds good yeah, certainly uh, going forward is going to be one of our most critical issues, finding the water. All right. On to uh, consent agenda. I think this is yours, Peter. Yeah, I'm muted. Uh. I move to approve the Wenham Select Board open session meeting minutes of June 21st, 2022, September 7th, 2022, and September 15th, 2022. Second. Any other comments? Otherwise, uh, roll call vote. Peter? Yes. Diane? Yes. Gary, yes. If I, if I may, did we get all the announcements or did I miss them? Is there an announcement about trick or treat and stuff like that? It's coming up. It's coming up. I'm sorry. Yeah, Thank so you. we've got to take a vote on it. So it's business. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Oh, I see. All right. <laughs> so uh, consent agenda is done. Moving along. So here you go, Diane. Halloween trick or treat hours. We uh, make the motion to have trick or treat in Wenham from 5 to 8 p.m. on Halloween. That's a Monday night. Residents who do not wish to receive trick-or-treaters on Halloween are encouraged to encouraged to turn off outdoor lighting. So, uh, Diane, you want to form a, a motion for those hours? Sure. I didn't realize this. Um, I move that we um, set the hours for trick-or-treating in the town of Wenham on, I think it's a Monday, October 31st from yes. 5 to 8 p.m. Peter Clay seconds. Any uh, questions or comments? Otherwise, roll call vote, Peter? Yes. Diane? Yes. Gary, yes. All right. So tonight we have a presentation by the Hamilton Wenham Athletic Fields Improvement Committee. 
As you know, in the uh, Saturday town meetings, the uh, both towns approved a stabilization fund that will allow the uh, school district to go ahead with these uh, projects as they accumulate money and go through the different phases. Otherwise, is it Michelle Horgan on presenting, Steve, or someone else from the committee? I do not see anybody uh, on right now. Unless anyone in the uh, in the audience can speak up, uh, I don't I don't see anybody from the school committee. All right. Well, um, Steve, do you want to? Yeah, let's uh, with the other two uh, board members. So we just uh, step on to see and uh, yeah, step on to see, and then you know we can either just move it to the next meeting or maybe they. We're thinking that'd be later in the agenda. All right. Uh, as far as timing, but I think we should just move on to see at this point. All right. Very well. Is that okay with you, Diane, Peter? Yeah, certainly. All right. So tonight, uh, as uh, Steve will show, a long process to uh, reach uh, some decisions on the uh, state and local fiscal recovery funds, which are part of uh, ARPA. So uh, tonight, uh, we've asked uh, many of the applicants to uh, come on, we've got uh, slides that they'll talk to and uh, get further details on each of those programs. So I'll turn it over to Steve, if you wanna go through the uh, preliminary slides there and set the stage, and then we'll invite others to come in and uh, discuss the, uh, their project. After each presentation, I propose that the select board will ask questions and uh, comments, but would hold the uh, public uh, comments to the end after everyone's finished. Is that okay with you, Diane and Peter? Yes. Yep. Yeah, all right. Yeah, so over like to you, to Steve. Stop. All right, would you like me to stop between each slide? Because I have a number of... Yeah, so I think uh, between each slide, just stop for a second and see if any of the three of us have particular yeah. questions. Sounds good. All right. All right, so this is just you know, backtrack and I know that it's been information overload, but um, you know, I figured it's worth just sharing again, what is ARPA? You hear these funds, it's the, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. Uh, it was signed into law on March 11, 2021. It basically um, provides a total of $350 billion in a state, uh, an additional funding for state and local governments to help them uh, build out infrastructure and deal with the direct impacts um, as related to the, the COVID pandemic. And be, because of these funds, essentially once you trickle down to all the states and local uh, counties and cities and towns in the, the uh, entire country, one share of that is about $1.4 million. There's uh, several allowable uses for these. Uh, it can be used for revenue replacement. So this would be lost revenue. Uh, due to impacts to the community's revenue sources, such as excise tax, local re local re local receipts, and local receipts such as building permit fees, uh, licensing fees, local election taxes such as meals and hotels hotel taxes. Uh, it is uh, expenditures are for economic impacts for COVID nineteen uh, to give assistance to small businesses households or hard hit in, in, uh, industries within the community, premium pay for essential workers and investment into water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. Uh, these funds are not to be um, used for to offset the tax rate. So essentially to use these one-time funds to reduce your tax bill in one year um, or to, uh, and the funds cannot be deposited into any pension fund directly to a stabilization fund or for the payment of debt service. And this is the timeline that we, you know, essentially from, like I mentioned before, March 11th, 2021, it was signed into law. And here are the steps that the town of Wenham has taken over the last couple of years, uh, year and a half, uh, to get to this point. Down, down at the bottom right, you'll see October 3rd, 2022. This is the public information session um, that we're discussing the top 25 ARPA funding projects. Um, so, you know, I won't go through every step, 
but I, you know, I will just want to, you know, highlight that, you know, Mr. We've had a couple of different administrators here in the seat, so you'll see the names uh, change throughout the slides. But uh, Mr. Ferreira, Town Minister at the time, um, on October 26th, emailed the Finance Committee and the Select Board Chairs um, with uh, an ARPA request from Senator Tar Tar's office requesting uh, the priorities of both those boards uh, and what they see um, their priorities are as far as ARPA spending. Um, and then Mr. Younger uh, sends, sends an all departments email on April, on April 21st to compile a list. This went out to all departments requesting a prioritized list of uh, potential ARPA projects due based on the uh, immediate needs of the town. And once that list was compiled on May 4th, it was sent to the auditor for review for compliance. And on May 5th, we heard back and Mr. Younger notified the select board and finance committee of the fact that the auditor has reviewed that list and uh, in his opinion, all are eligible for the funding. Um, there was also a question as, as to the uh, the date and I didn't update it, uh, so that's my error, but about um, three select board, four select board meetings ago, the select board ranked all 63 projects uh, in order of importance to them based on their intimate knowledge of the town and giving them a score. So we were able to numerically rank all the projects and come up with the, essentially the top 30, which would be, uh, which would spend the available funds, which uh, is roughly um, you know, the $1.2 million and uh, two times, two and a half times. So we're looking at about you know 2.5 to $3 million worth of expenditure requested with the $1.2 million. That's how we arrived at the top 25. Um, and they've since had a couple, since that have had a couple uh, public information um, discussions, just general discussions on the um, on the use of ARPA funds. Uh, one of them on sort of seventh was a joint meeting with the FinCom, and that leads us to the presentation tonight. So, what's next? After we go through, we're going to go through all the slides. Uh, those of these are all these are the top uh, twenty five projects, and. Uh, in no order of, of ranking. They are just grouped by the um, the requesting department so that if an individual has more than one slide, they'll be grouped together. And once once um, once this is through, we are going to create a public survey so that the residents can view this presentation and make uh, you know an educational decision based on um, you know, their own knowledge of the town and their own uh, determination for needs and be able to rank them so that the select board can take the input and det determine the final ranking for expenditures of, of ARPA funds. The first one I'm gonna, the first request, and I think, uh, you know, it's one of the one of the most important ones is- oh, Steve, yeah. uh, just a question for you. Um, what's the cost of all of these in total? I'm going to say roughly, I mean, the costs are still fluctuating as we hammer out uh, the details, but roughly about 2.5 to $2.7 million will be the cost of all these uh, projects that. So that's how much over what we have? Um, a little over twice. So when, so when we do the survey monkey, are we going to set that up? that we're going to put a price on every one of these things you're looking at and just understand that we're, they add up to double. So we can only do about half, half the money represented by all these projects. Yeah. Um, right. So, you know, at a high level, I, um, what, what essentially what we're looking to do is to do well to do just that to to educate folks on what the projects mean how much they cost and then allow everybody to go through the same exercise that the select board went through in ranking them and what this will ultimately provide us is a quantitative approach to ranking the projects and coming up with a list even though we've spent the you know say we 
say we arrive at a list, the top 25 projects, you know, obviously you're not going to get through all 25 projects because you spent the money two times over, but what it gives you is a list to work off of. So maybe we can get to the first 15 definitely, but then we're able to find alternative sources of funding such as CPC funds for the HVAC in the town hall. And that gives us, you know, we've found, so let's say found $300,000 worth of funding that no longer has to come from opera that allows us to just move further down the list. So we can then take the next project that was kind of on deck uh, that may or may not get funded, we can then, you know, now that project can get funded or maybe the next three or four projects because it's a large amount of money, but it gives us a prioritized list to work off of. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the select board? Good here. All right. All right, so the first request is, uh, in my opinion, one of the, you know, well, they're all important, but what this one is, is essentially it's revenue replacement. So this is, this, these are revenues that the town would have otherwise received if the pandemic uh, never happened. So the, the two, um, the two pieces here are the iron rail, which is the revenue loss from the pandemic, pandemic due to the impact on the operations of the tenants uh, and causing them the inability to pay their rent through a certain period of time. We estimate this impact to be at about $95,000 and town lost revenue. So this is revenue loss, like I mentioned on, on a previous uh, slide to the economic impacts of excise tax generation. So with the chip shortages and you know the closures, people were unable to buy new cars. And when you don't have the vehicle turnover, you don't have the excise tax generation ability because the new cars are undepreciated uh, when calculating the excise tax and the used cars are, you know, go to about 10% appreciation within the first five years. So right there, without the turn of vehicles, you see a large impact in your excise tax generation. Uh, that's probably our largest driver to the lost revenue. But with that, with the closures, we also saw, um, you know, a reduction in building permit fees, uh, any local tax, which is hotel, motel, meals tax, uh, licensing and other miscellaneous permitting fees that the town does for you know, conservation and, and things like that. So we estimate that impact to be at about $300,000. And you know, just, I wanna remind everyone that this is money that the town would have received. So this would be essentially money that would have you know, been in excess of the budgeted, budgeted revenue amounts that would have generated additional free cash balance in any given year, which would have, which have, you know, and all things being equal, which would provided um, more budget budgetary flexibility, uh, larger reserves, and the ability to um, to handle this inflationary environment that we're in right now. And this is for the iron rail. So this is for uh, planning for the iron rail property. There's been a lot of talk since I started, at least about. You know, what to do with the iron rail property? Does the town want to be um, in the business of being uh, a landlord or is there a better use for the property? Like what's the most advantageous use for the property uh, for the town? So this uh, estimation of $2,000 would pay for a redevelopment study and appraisal and help with the highest and best use um, analysis. And it's uh, very timely with the master plan advisory committee because, you know, we can align that with not only the highest and best use, but a lot of that lot of the highest and best use in line with the uses that the town determines through the um, through the master plan uh, process as being the uses that they want here in town. Uh, information technology. So these are we have some pretty significant information technology needs. Our server is uh, so our data center is about seven years old. And based on uh, the industry uh, professionals I've talked to, replacement cycles that are recommended for three to five years on this type of hardware. So we're you know, outside the life expectancy and essentially on borrowed time uh, at this point with our server. You're looking at probably $200,000 to replace the server. Uh, network switching replacement. So that's, we have one at the COA, police, fire, town hall, 
that's the network coming in um, both for the internet and to maintain our network connections uh, for the network drives and email, things like that. Current switching in each of these locations is about seven to 10 years old. Again, industry replacement recommends three to five year replacement on switches. You're looking at about $5,500 or $6,000 per switch to buy the switch and have it replaced. We have four of them. And then just various uh, security and hardware upgrades. Right now, uh, we don't have a, uh, a defined replacement cycle for our hardware. Uh, we do have some updated uh, pieces of, uh, you know, PCs, printers, scanners. So we'd be looking to to bring us up to, uh, you know, essentially so that all our machines are compatible with, you know, the, mo the more modern uh, versions of Windows and uh, the ability to run Outlook 365 as we mi migrate over to there and then establish a baseline so that we can implement a formal replacement cycle going forward. Uh, also to... Uh, to correct or to fix our fiber optic connection to the various town locations. We do have uh, some connections, but there is, um, I believe the, the line is broken in places. And that would allow us to, if we did have a fiber connection to all satellite locations, we'd be able to re eliminate redundancy based on the fact that we have, like I mentioned before, we're maintaining four switches in each location, but it would, it would, it would allow us to have one master switch um, for a similar cost, and you'd be a replacement cycle on just that one switch instead of having to do four. And network security upgrades. So things like Maya is um, our our liability insurance is getting more and more strict with things like multi-factor authentication. Outlook 365 does have the multi-factor authentication for email, which we plan on utilizing as we migrate over there. But uh, things are getting stricter and stricter, and likely it will be a network wide encryption where we're going to have to use multi-factor uh, access to gain access, uh, you know, every day when we come to work and, and sign in or sign in from our laptops at home. And uh, this one, I'll let uh, Rich or Mike Hardy jump in as we, oh, let me uh, stop and ask if the select board has any questions on the slides that I just presented. Peter? I do not. Diane? Just a quick one. It, it's probably just a price update. On my last list, it was one hundred fifty thousand for all those IT things. Yeah, so that was right. So that was um, that was an estimation that I used, not knowing the age of the data center, okay, and the age of the switches. Uh, so I had um, I met with uh, Colby Cousins, who is the director of the. North Shore IT uh, coalition that we're a member of, which is uh, comprised mm -hmm. of several communities in the area and also with Tom Rudden, uh, our uh, direct IT provider to go over those details and that's what they presented to me. And I've updated, updated the number accordingly. Thank you. So is uh, Rich or uh, Mike on? Oh. Rich Souza here. I um, I can jump in, and I think Mike is on the call too. So, if there's any questions I have, um, he can probably fill in. But, uh, yep. So, uh, this this is regards to buildings and grounds. Um, first one we have is the iron rail, uh, the septic system replacement, uh, which, which has been known for a while that that system um, has basically outlived its its life expectancy. Uh, there has been in-house repair uh, performed. Uh, before my time, but um, I, you know we have done work there, and um, it's really at the point where that septic system um, needs to be replaced. You know that in, in lieu of the you know, couple of previous slides where there's going to be a bit of a uh, study at the at the iron rail um, you know facility itself, but um, one of the first orders of business would be replacing that septic uh, if we were to if to we were to remain um, ownership of that. Um, number two, town hall HVAC replacement. Now, this is a, a closed loop water system. So what happens is um, there's no fresh makeup air from the outside. A um, couple things there. One, um, obviously the fresh air is better for occupants uh, within the building. The closed loop water system creates um, 
the pipes to sweat and you know there's there's observable water damage and the first picture is a, um, a heater in one of the offices and you can see rust I um, mean you know, it's basically throughout the system um, there's just been you know wear and tear on it so um, the, uh, the recommendation is to replace the system that would be more efficient uh, better filtration you know, introducing the makeup air. Um, good news, or I guess encouraging news, is since we submitted this slide with the five hundred thousand dollar price tag, we have received um, an initial um, estimate that came in more about three hundred and fifty. Uh, Mike and myself need to go through that and just, I get you know more or less feel comfortable with that, making sure um, you know they're not missing any contingencies that we should have in there, but. Um, again, it, it's encouraging that that's where that came in. Um, the third is town hall, the, um, the main entry doors replacement. So these are the, the entry doors on the parking lot side. Um, few issues here. One is you, you can pretty much walk up to that door during off hours and give it a good pull and you can almost you know, rip it ajar. It, it, the bottom doesn't latch and there's um, some security issues there. And additionally, with the, with that, the, this third picture on this slide, it, it's hard to see through the size, but you can see daylight down the bottom there. Um, so not only is that a security issue, but um, a energy efficiency issue where, you know, heat loss, uh, obviously this coming up this time of year um, and AC loss. So, um, you know, it would be new fob system. The doors would uh, latch properly. It would boost up security. So um, that's where, you know, our recommendation just to replace uh, the, the whole the whole pack door package. Um, any questions, you know, feel free. Diane, any questions? I do have a question. Um, Rich, so if we decide to do something with iron rail, do we mm -hmm. would we still do the septic system replacement? Would be, I was just so, wondering. Well, yeah, so I guess it depends on what that, what the fate, I guess, is as far as um, continue, you know, continued occupancy where you're going to have users of the septic system, um, the, we would have to update that and, you know, replace that system. Um, so it's, it's really the, you know, looking at it as what that building in the future, how, how that will be utilized by the town and the, and the demand. So I, I think Diane, to answer the question is that, you know, if we were to remain owners and operate it similarly, then we, should definitely do that system. Right, Got it. Think, Thank you. I think my understanding is that the uh, Rich Kirk and Vaughn, that it, it's it, it's a relatively urgent repair, mm. right? So like, it's not like we have years to figure out to let the master planning process go through, figure out what we're gonna do. This is something that really, there's a, there's a number of deferred capital items over there, but this was one that was, identified sure. as something that really needs to be addressed sooner rather than later. Yes, time, yeah, time is not on our side for that particular system. Thank you. Peter, Gary, you guys have any questions? Uh, good here, Peter, anything? Uh, no, I think that's, if it really comes in at 350, that's gonna be a big deal. <laughs> yeah, like I said, that was, it's, an, it's encouraging. Um, it's definitely in, in going in the right direction. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. All right. This one is actually a, a combination of three requests, but we've taken those three requests down. They're all related to town hall security updates. Uh, we thought it best to speak of them uh, uh, very generally to, uh, you know, to kind of not show our cards, so to speak, as to what we're planning on doing. But I can say that, 
you know, really uh, three three primary projects, and they were really uh, pretty much industry standards as far as security, best practices go as far as security for uh, the safety of the public visiting the building, uh, the individuals that work in the building, uh, our ability to keep um, documents safe, cash safe, uh, and, and things like that. Uh, it's, you know, it's just some some areas that we're not really up to par on and we could do better in. And they were identified as um, this could be an opportunity where we could address these needs. Is there an amount? Yeah, it's um, I believe it's uh, thirty five thousand dollars total for all of them. Thank you. And the direct the uh, any I'm sorry any other questions on that slide? No, good on? to hear. None from me. And the next one is, um, so this is an allowable use. This is one of the uh, the key, you know, the key reasons for these funds is to help communities across the country deal with the impact of the coronavirus. And with, with these federal funds, not just ARPA, but CARES, um, CARES Act funds, we've talked about FEMA related funds, all that require, um, you know, not only a significant amount of um, reporting, but also audits, right? So the, the state wants to see the audited uh, records of all these expenditures. The federal government wants to see audited reports of these expenditures. They then will audit your results where that they will be asking you for. For example, we had one, uh, you know, and this is just a $47 piece of plexiglass. They want a picture of the plexiglass. They want to know you know, if it's permanently affixed to the ceiling or to the floor, the age of the building and a narrative as to what the need was, uh, what the driving need was to need to install that piece of plexiglass. So that's the level of, um, you know, auditing that they're doing. And so, you know, they, they're allowing for the help with the management reporting audits or independent auditor charges us a fee every time we have them audit our records to submit it to the, to the federal government uh, and technology requirements as they're related to uh, hybrid meetings and uh, the cleaning uh, and PPE equipment uh, as it relates to COVID-19. So these are the essentially the four projects at the top of the presentation, which is has to do with, uh, you know, again, auditing, reporting, technology for hybrid meetings uh, and cleaning that were discussed at the prior select board meeting. Uh, we can provide more details online, and um, its total cost is about $100,000. The select board voted to, you know, essentially move those through as an allowable funding source due to the nature that they're unavoidable cost and a cost that we do not have budgeted or a revenue source for. Any questions on that one? No, I think we're good. We're good. Too. So this is um, so they want the water department wants to do a water system study. So they they know that there's a, you know a significant amount, they've done some improvements. Uh, they know that there is uh, you know a significant amount of uh, capital improvements that still need to be done, and essentially they want to have a study done, it's $100,000 to come in and, you know, help inventory our infrastructure and come up with a capital plan that's the most cost effective and time effective um, way of going about updating uh, the water system here in town. So it'll be you know, essentially provide a, a roadmap of short-term immediate needs and long-term needs and how best to, you know, to start to, you know, start to handle them. Uh, and address them. That's there and there. Any questions on this slide? You said that was a hundred thousand. Yes. No questions for me. And I believe this entails, you know, actual on-site inspections, right, of uh, pipelines and hydrants and so forth. Yeah, it's a pretty. Involved, my understanding is a, it's a, it's a very involved study. Um, yeah, so I think there'll be scoping pipes and identifying locations and you know really helping close some loose ends that we have all 
All right. Moving on. Yep. Great. We have a uh, sorry. We have a, another uh, rich rich Sousa slide. Yep. So uh, this this now is highway department focused. Um, so these these three projects, um, basically identifying three needs um, in town that we I want to continue. Um, you know, updating and repair, replacing. So first is um, AD ramp, ADA ramp and sidewalk, sidewalk repairs. So this would be a, a bit of a continuance um, around, uh, you know, Buker School and the library um, area where um, there's, you know, I would I consider highly traveled sidewalks um, that need proper, um, ADA ramp installations and also some stretches of sidewalk that could be um, replaced. So it, it's really just sort of a, a continuation of being able to link, um, you know, basically from the library, you know, down to, you know, right down to the town hall, you know, right basically Main Street. Um, and again, in and around the, the school uh, zone. Um, second one is uh, stormwater drainage and culvert repairs. This one's for $40,000. Uh, this is it's really just to be able to do additional repair work, camera work, um, you know, a, a for instance, uh, we just recently went out uh, for West Wenham Park and cameraed the, uh, the drainage system from the park, you know, down to uh, Tossfield Road, uh, jetted anything that was, um, any any blockages and basically cleared out that system, you know that that localized system um, to ensure, you know, proper storm water flow. So this would really be just as as issues come up, there's funds to be able to go out, um, identify, and then repair uh, these these lines. So you know we do have um, an ongoing list. So we, you know we basically start working on that list. Um, so that, again, that's just a, 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 a you know, help to the budget to, to do more work. Um, and then the third is you know, similar in the sense for setting, you know, various roadway paving projects uh, of $75,000. I, um, I put that note in there regarding, you know, th I think it would make, uh, it'd be good use of these funds to, you know, take a look at the streets that don't qualify under chapter 90 program. Um, two biggest, I mean, I guess the, the, the biggest driver for that criteria is any street under 500 feet um, does not qualify for chapter 90. And obviously, you know, Wenham has, you know, various streets that are, that are less than that. So, um, you know, I have to use capital funds uh, or, you know, if, you know, Situation like this comes up, I could use this this money towards that. So that is where I think I'd get the most bang for my buck would be to uh, identify roads that are um, not going to qualify for Chapter ninety and 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 use the funds to you know to do some uh, resurfacing there. Um, so that that's really the you know those those three bullets um, is to be able just to continue you know with. Yeah. The, with the you know maintenance uh, and and repair of the of the you know, infrastructure, so feel any any questions feel free. Peter, I have no questions. I think Diane. what you've done on, on school streets amazing. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. I have no questions, and I like that as well. Around Buker, it looks great. Thank you. Echoed a third time. All right. Next okay. slide, then. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. All right, um, Chief Kavanaugh will present on uh, Ho Jeff back. Oh, Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So the Jaws of Life, the current set of Jaws of Life extrication tools are 20 plus years old and are in dire need for replacement. The company that manufactures our current set is no longer in business and finding replacement parts is next one possible. I'm looking to replace the current set of Jaws of Life with an electric set. 
the set we now have run off a gas powered unit, which also has hydraulic lines, which are a complete mess during an accident scene. The electric set would allow us to move around a vehicle more freely without hydraulic lines in the way and would allow us to use multiple tools and at once for a quicker extrication of an individual. So I'm asking you to hopefully support this Jaws of Life unit. Chief, do you remember off the top of your head the costs on something like this? It's about forty-seven to fifty thousand. Okay. I, I know I have it earmarked for forty-seven, but it can, you know, we did this almost a year and a half ago. This, and it's just coming to light now. We already had a, so I imagine the costs have gone up some on on everything. So. Any questions on that? Not here. No, Diane's good. Here. Right. Thank you. So the SCBA fill station fills the tanks that you see on firefighters' backs for use during any incident that would require that firefighter to go, in, go on air and not breathe in smoke and dangerous gases. The current SCBA fill station is once again a 20-plus-year-old piece of equipment that desperately needs to be replaced. The current fill station only allows one bottle to be filled at a time, where the new fill station would allow firefighters to fill three bottles at a time. The explosion chamber, which the SCBA bottle sits in during the filling procedure, will soon be out of NFPA compliance either way. I'm asking the select board to once again support this very important piece of equipment. Questions on this one, Peter? Nope, I support it. Diane? No questions, thanks. Right. Next then. All right, as you can see the bullet points there, I'm also gonna, I'd like to read a letter that I wrote. It should be less than a minute, I'm hoping. I'll read fast. When COVID-19 first struck this town, the firefighters for the town of Wenham answered, every single call fire and medical. When the firefighters responded to homes or businesses in town, they did not know if the homeowners or business owners had COVID. This was the worst part of the job because frankly, it scared every single one of us. Some of the firefighters, young and older, had babies, small children, elderly parents, and spouses to care for when we arrived home. This in fact was the scariest because we knew we were treating and transporting patients with known COVID, and we just never knew what, in fact, we would bring home. Our full-time staff went to work every day and did not have the luxury of logging in on our computers from the safety of our homes. Our firefighters worked tirelessly and selflessly and responded to every call without hesitation. So to me, not only as chief of the department, but also a taxpayer, this is a very small amount to show our support and respect for our first responders. I would also like to add, while most people think COVID has passed, it has not. And ever since day one of the pandemic, we are still transporting COVID patients on a regular basis. Thank you. Any questions on that? Diane? No, no. thank you, Chief. I think we're good. Thank you. So, uh, if we move into a different category, then uh, thank you, Chief. So, uh, three uh, major items from you. Thank you. All need serious consideration. All right. Right. Next. Library. Yep. The next uh, next two slides will be from the library, and I believe uh, Kim is with us tonight. Hello. Um, Evening, so Kim. our. <laughs> Hi. Um, so our two requests, uh, the first one is um, an new, uh, access control system and security camera system. Um, so we are asking for um, a cloud-based system that would control um, the, front, the front doors and our meeting room doors and would also include a key fob system for staff. Um, our key locks are as old as the building, probably, you know, the 20, 21 years old. Um, we've had them repaired multiple times, especially over the last year, two years. 
Um, we've had to have the casings replaced on the meeting room doors. We are in the process of getting the casings replaced on the front door. Um, and we've also not had a great tracking system of who has been given master keys over the years. So um, we're thinking this would solve a, a major security gap that we have um, by, by installing this type of system. It would also have a, a way to automatically program the doors to lock and unlock at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, which puts less pressure on the, um, the bar releases that we have because those have been repaired as well. Um, and in the same um, amount of money would be um, a security SAMRA system um, that would be inside the building mostly, and perhaps we're thinking at least one camera by the front door, just to, um, we've had some, some vandalism issues, especially the last couple of years since we reopened, um, and also to keep staff and patrons safe when inside the building. Um, we, we see roughly, last year we saw about 56,000 people walk through our front doors. Um, so it's definitely something that, that we should have in order to, to be safe. Um, any questions on that? Kim, would that be still just about 20,000, you think? Yeah, the original quote is a couple of years old. So I just, yeah, it's right in that ballpark. It might be a little bit less, but. Okay. And so the second one is um, our HVAC system, um, again, another another 20, 21 year old um, system and project. Um, we actually have three um, air cooled condensers on our roof. One of them services just the large meeting room. And for some reason, knock on wood, that one has operated pretty seamlessly. Um, it's the other two units that service the main building that have had some major issues. Um, since 2010, we've spent over $25,000 in repairs to the cooling units. Um, we had a particularly bad summer this year with them. Um, if anyone was in the building, uh, especially the second floor, the second floor on some of those really hot days was getting to 76, 78 degrees. Um, they, they just couldn't keep up. Um, and we've also gone through three different green community grants to try to rectify and repair those issues. I did um, talk to Mike Hardy and to Vicki Masoni just to recap what we had already done and what we had already put into the system to try to kind of rectify this and, and limp by. Um, so they did the testing, the balancing, they adjusted the control panels, they did ductwork cleaning, and we're still at, at this point. Questions? Peter? None, none for me. Diane? No. All right. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Hey, and uh, this Kristen Nunes is on. Yes, I am here. Hey, Kristen. Hi, how are you? Good. Good. Um, so thank you very much for um, letting me speak this evening on behalf of the Wenham Museum. As you may recall, the ARPA funding does permit municipalities to um, award funding in certain circumstances to nonprofits in their communities. And with that in mind, the Wenham Museum submitted a request to the town of Wenham for funding under ARPA. Our funding request had two components. The first was basically pandemic recovery, which is a revenue replacement request. Uh, the Wenham Museum closed to the public on Friday, March 13th, 2020, when ordered to do so by the Commonwealth. We reopened on July 7th of 2020, effectively at the earliest possible date with the then public health um, limitations that were in place. So we were allowed to reopen, but we were not allowed to operate at full capacity. As a result of that, many of our programs were not able to happen. Many of our special events could not occur. We are significantly reliant on special event revenue on my phone. as well as visitation driven forms of revenue. So over the sort of two first years of the pandemic from March 
of 2020 through March of 2022, the Wenham Museum lost $176,000 in revenue from in-building forms of engagement. This fiscal year, the Wenham Museum is also celebrating its 100th anniversary. So we have requested an additional amount to reflect that um, in honor of the longstanding you know, partnership and relationship that the town of Wenham has had with the Wenham Museum. We would intend to use all of these funds to restore the programming and the staffing that we have had to eliminate due to these drops in visitation. Our visitation has not recovered to pre-COVID levels. Prior to COVID, we were serving about 35,000 people a year. Um, visitation has continued to rebound, but we are right now at about 12,000 visitors a year. So this is a significant loss of income for the institution, which has resulted in you know, substantial um, adjustments in operations and in staffing. Should these funds be awarded to the museum, we would endeavor to put them back to work in the community by restoring programming, such as you know, school programming, public programming, programs for adults. I know many folks do think of the museum as a destination for children and families, and we're very proud of, of those relationships that we have, but we also do offer um, opportunities for adults as well as steward a very large permanent collection of 45,000 objects that really um, chronicles the stories of Wenham history and local history. These funds would also go to help support staff that um, care for those collections and make them publicly available either through programs or through social media or on our website. We would also use these funds to better communicate what the Wenham Museum um, has available to the community to support learning not only for children and schools, but also for community members at large to help facilitate research requests, genealogical requests to really um, best execute our mission for the benefit of all. We would also apply these funds over several fiscal years. You know, the Wenham Museum, I think for much of its, its long life here um, as a hundred year old institution has really often run on a shoestring budget where we are and remain dependent on volunteers and interns. I don't see that changing. Um, we are able to really make the most of the funding that we do have. Um, however, we are at a point where we really do need to reinvest in the capacity of the institution to serve our community and meet the expectations of the community for the level of service and the quality of service and programming that they would expect. So that would be our anticipated use um, for the funds. I would say, you know, we've been able to operate with, a, you know, a, a sustainable budget during COVID, but that has been through extremely aggressive expense management, as well as two PPP loans and some generous giving in the first year of the, of the pandemic to our annual fund. Um, now that the PPP loan program and other forms of relief are not available to us, we are asking the town of Wenham to help support the institution through the remainder of its recovery from COVID. I do encourage everyone to come to the master planning process on Thursday evening. Not only is that process, I believe, really important for the future of Wenham, I say that as a resident, as well as the museum director, I think it's also really a great opportunity for people to come to the museum and see our 100th anniversary exhibition celebrating a century, our stories and yours. Um, this exhibition really truly does focus intensively on Wenham history. I think there's a lot here that people maybe don't know or haven't seen before on display in our galleries. It is geared to a multi-generational audience for both children and adults. Um, the institution is opening up you know, our halls for free to the community on that evening so they can have a chance to see some of this history firsthand for themselves. Um, I think we have so much to offer. There's so much more this institution would like to do for the community. We have no shortage of ideas. We frankly just need um, the support from a financial standpoint at this point to make all of those um, hopes and plans a reality. Comments, Peter? Questions? Well, I went, I went to the 100th anniversary, um, was that Friday? Our opening on Thursday, yes. Yeah, yeah. Thursday, sorry. That was, yeah. that was really good. 
Oh, Speakers were blood. fantastic. Good, good, good. Diane? I don't have any questions. Thanks so much for coming. My pleasure. Thank you, Kristen. And thanks for the pitch for the uh, open forum for the master plan too. Yes, I will be here. So I hope everyone comes, bring your families. It will, it will be fun. So, <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Thank Next. you. All right. Kate Mallory will present on uh, West Wenham Park. Hi, everyone. I'd, I'd like to first thank the select board members, our town administrator and the community for having me here today in considering this very exciting project. The open space committee is asking for $170,000 to partially fund the West Wenham Park project. The current West Wenham Park has a play field, basketball and tennis courts in need of repair, no ADA accessibility and limited parking. The Open Space Committee was awarded funding from CPC for a feasibility study of the park. This included a survey which concluded the community wants a place not only with play structures for young children, but where families can gather. A destination park where middle schoolers would enjoy park play over the current draw of Cumberland Farms, or so I've heard. Taking everything into consideration, we came up with the plan pictured on the right of your screen. The total of this plan would cost $700,000. The infrastructure piece would be around $170,000, which includes ADA accessibility, drainage, green infrastructure, parking, and signage. The Open Space Committee has been trying to creatively diversify funding sources to maximize the chance for success. We have not only applied just for ARPA funding, but we've applied for state grants. Our next step will be applying for CPC funding. We are starting community fundraising and we have already applied for and received $20,000 from the state of Massachusetts. So why ARPA funding? The park will not only expand the existing facilities, but the infrastructure work will ensure universal access and make the park ADA compliant. The goal is to rejuvenate a valuable resource so it meets the demands of multiple generations in a recreationally underserved area. I thank you guys so much for your time and look forward to your feedback. Thanks, Kate. Peter? Maybe not. Diane? No, that was great. Thank you, Kate. Yes. So the, uh, you're looking at the 170 as the uh, initial infrastructure part? Yes, we figured with um, the fundraising activities, the grants we applied for, that the infrastructure piece is the hardest part for us to raise. And we figured that it would fit into the ARPA funding um, nicely, and it would really help get the project um, moving and off the ground. All right. Very well. One more chance for Peter. No, nope. all right. Thank you, Kate. Gary, uh, Ernest Ashley raises. Oh, yes, uh, your hand. hand. Ernest. Now. Yeah, let's. Um, Thank Ernest, you very much, it, uh, Ernest uh, is he like Ashley. Directly to the park. Yes. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Ernest Ashley of Nine Foster Street, and I speak as chair of the Open Space and Recreation Committee to encourage. Uh, the support for the application of ARPA funds for that infrastructure, which would be necessary really to initiate redevelopment of the West Wenham Park. As, as Kate mentioned, we had a feasibility study done and we find economical uh, proposed improvements and the ARPA funds would really be seed money to be able to have ADA compliance and more access for this underutilized uh, area in a recreationally underserved part of the town. So thanks very much for the opportunity and the consideration for this uh, request. Thank you, Ernest. All right, so this one, um, 
I can jump in and I'll, I'll present this one. You got this, Steve, yes. Yeah, so <clears throat> this is a request for added planning support. So right now we're in kind of a unique um, situation for the town of Wenham. So we have a, a master planning process going on right now. Um, the new, uh, the, so we have MBTA communities. So communities that have an MBTA station uh, within their bounds uh, are going to need to address uh, the new zoning requirements. So significant increase in density for um, the zoning that immediately surrounding the MBTA station. So we also have uh, the development of um, the so-called Pulte Homes development at the Gordon College property. Uh, Route 1A uh, is going through their redevelopment. We're looking at, uh, you know, uh, possibilities of the redevelopment of iron rail or, uh, you know, different uses. And then just the general action items that are determined by the master, but by, by the uh, finalized master plan uh, and the management of those. So there's really a lot going on in the planning department. We currently have uh, just uh, Margaret and she is only only budgeted for 23 hours a week. We are asking the um, you know select board and the residents to uh, approve uh, an additional $45,000 to be spent over the next two or three years to either increase Margaret's um, hours if you know if she has the desire, or to uh, give her some support in the office uh, to kind of help help her address all these things because uh, you know, it's a very it's a very stressed office um, right now for only only one person. And Margaret, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, I'm sorry, I should have told you I was here to present this if you needed me to. Um, yeah, I appreciate this opportunity just to let you know that all of these new projects have started uh, to come at us. We're trying to uh, facilitate as much as we can. But again, my hours were budgeted just for 23. Kate is also in our office. Um, she is a part-time worker also at 19 hours. So Kate has a lot on her plate as well. And on top of all of these newer um, potential large projects, um, also wanted to mention that Maplewoods is going to be starting this uh, probably within the next month. They're gonna be doing some groundbreaking um, so that's going to be another large project that our office will be involved with overseeing. Um, but again, it's mostly if I if I were to um, add my own uh, add hours uh, to my workload, and then um, possibly add some for Kate, and then uh, if we find the need to add an additional person just for some a few hours here and there to help fill in. But again, I appreciate you letting us present this stuff tonight and hope you'll consider our request. Thank you, Margaret. Diane, any questions? No questions from me, thank you. Thanks for coming, both of you. Peter? I think it's a pretty amazing time yeah. in Wenham. Yes. You know, we've, there's just a lot of opportunity out there and then there's potential disasters like the MBTA thing. Um, but um, yeah, Margaret, you're you're going to be having a lot of fun over the next couple of years. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Peter. Um, I wanted to say too that there this this seems like an unprecedented time for Wenham. We're so pleased that the master plan is progressing and that the community is going to have an opportunity to give their input on Thursday night. In case anyone hasn't heard that yet, <laughs> there is a community forum being held. Thursday night at the museum. Um, but when you look at the new MBTA communities regulations that has the potential for a fairly significant amount of development for, for Wenham uh, in terms of multifamily housing, this uh, possible Gordon College development, we don't know what that's going to end up being, but it seems like Gordon College really is poised to do something. Um, so, you know, we're looking at possible new economic development after, you know, with the master plan study that happens. So I really think this is going to be a very exciting time for Wenham. And the residents have a lot of um, thinking to do about how they want to see th this community progress as, as time goes on. And um, again, I think the master plan is a great opportunity for everyone to give us their input. Um, again, I appreciate your time. Thanks. 
Hey, Margaret, I, I get invited to all these MBTA webinar, webinars. Oh, yeah. That, um, are those things worth listening to? Um, Peter, I'll tell you, they, they really are, but they're, they're coming at us fast and furious, which is good. The Mass Housing Partnership, DHCD, um, MAPC, all of these organizations are having their own webinars with information sessions about the MBTA community's regulations. Um, just um, as a little side note, we are in communication with our town council as well as talking to DHCD and MHP just so that we're starting to get poised for this. We know we have certain things that we have to do, but um, we're, st we're staying on top of it, the timeline to make, to make sure things happen. Ultimately, it will result in a new overlay district on revisions to our bylaw that will um, somehow allow for some multifamily um, housing to be built in town. But it's not, it's not coming right away. There's still another year before I think we, we need to actually have something in place. So, but, but we're trying to stay on top of it. We just need so, the hours to so do that. that. That means yeah. I should not listen to any of these webinars until about maybe nine months from now. Yeah, I'll let you know. <laughs> it wouldn't hurt to listen to them, but it, there is a lot of information going around and I don't think anyone's completely clear on how it's going to impact each community yet. But, but those answers will be forthcoming. Anything else, Diane? No, thanks. All right. Good on this one then, Steve, I think. I just want to just add quick, you know, like Margaret said, unprecedented times, uh, you know, in, in the development. So, you know, we have some real, real, you know, some real economic development opportunities here. And just to reinforce that, you know, with economic development can come increased tax revenues uh, and also the ability to spread the uh, existing tax burden over a larger commercial, over a larger tax base. Um, so, and with that, you know, we want to be able to do it right, right? So we want to have the resources to be able to vet these projects and do what's best for the community. All right. Uh, so police, police department's up. I believe Chief DiNapoli, is this you? This is me. Good evening, everybody. I think I'm the last one, so that makes me special. Mm. Um, so this, this first thing, it, regarding the administration area relocation, when our uh, station was built, it, they, the layout uh, was kind of unorthodox for the traditional uh, basic industry standard that usually is in place for a law enforcement agency, specifically a municipal police department. What happened is the uh, normally you have a, an isolated separate office for uh, supervisors, depending on the uh, structure and layout. Uh, and the breakdown of your agency. It could be lieutenants, could be sergeants, what have you. In our case, we have three uh, patrol sergeants. However, they don't have their own workspace or work area. Uh, also, normally in most cases, a detective a bureau or a division, or in our case, an isolated individual detective also has their own workspace uh, for uh, obviously private conversations, for interviews, for um sensitive material, sensitive matters, all things of that nature. Um, again, a common uh, industry standard. And then along those same lines, in, in any agency, if, if we were to think of being in other police departments, or if you've ever been in any uh, police department, you'll notice the administrative area is usually, if not 95% of police departments I've ever been in, uh, is separate. Um, in a separate area as well with an executive administrative assistant for uh, the reasons as listed above uh, relative to sensitive materials, uh, budget conversations, internal conversations, medical psychological documents for the employees. Uh, for all that reason, this is simply um, a relocation of the existing uh, template and layout uh, that's currently in place now in the, in the department. Um, it just to, to be congruent and to go with how things are usually structured uh, and set up in, in current modern day uh, police agencies. Is any, any question? Any. All makes sense to me, Kevin. Thank you, Pia. Um, and then 
Well, following up uh, relative to echo what Chief Kavanaugh said, I thought he was very eloquent and he, and, you know, I don't want to belabor the point too much because he made some, some phenomenal points. Uh, but this is a small ask for what the men and women of, you know, specifically our police department dealt with, along with all those men and women in police and fire and first responders throughout the country uh, dealt with coming into work during the pandemic. We all remember when we were wiping down our groceries. We all remember when we had no idea what it entailed. And, and my wife, God bless her, as a nurse, dealt with the same thing. And uh, there was so much unknown. And on a regular day without a pandemic, you go to work as a police officer or a firefighter, not knowing if you're going to go home. And, uh, and when this all started, and now even till this day, we, the men and women of our agency, did not miss a day of work never complained one day, never asked for any special treatment, never asked for any special schedules. They literally asked for nothing and came to work and made my life and Deputy Chief Lucantoni's life uh, as administrators trying to run an agency during this tough time made it so much easier because of uh, their wherewithal and their integrity and their work ethic and everything they did. I was beyond proud to, to be a leader of this agency. And this is simply a, a small ask from, from these men and women uh, for, to be, uh, to be you know, noted for what they did and what they went through. And uh, you know, I'd be more than happy to answer questions about that as well. None for me. Is there a third please slide? Uh, no, there's not, sir. Right, so if we go back uh, the, uh, the previous one on the reconfiguration, Yes. Does that include any actual uh, structural changes within the building? Yeah, so my, minor, the structural, specific structural would be uh, some sheetrock um, and a few doors as far as structural. Um, obviously, there'd be some relocation um, of some um, outlets and there'd be some more moving around than anything. The existing offices that are currently in place the proposal would be my current office would be for the three sergeants to have an isolated sergeant's office. And then the deputy's current office would then act as um, a detective office as well. So those structurally wouldn't be changed at all. It would be more the existing uh, patrol room down the end of the hallway that would become uh, the traditional admin area that most agencies have. A lot of agencies, you'll see it either as a separate wing or in a larger agency, it's usually a separate floor. Uh, but in, if anything, in one level agencies, it's almost all the time a separate wing or a separate area uh, in the existing layout. Thank you. Thank you. Peter, anything? No, totally supportive. Diane? So I'm just wondering with that, why it was built this way? Any idea? Was it different at that time? Candidly, I, I think just from hearing from passing down from the past two chiefs is, is there were a lot of cuts at the time. There were other proposals for different things that they were trying for, and it just became a dollars and cents thing. It's a little frustrating because I think the layout change wouldn't have changed, I don't think, financially a whole bunch. Uh, with the with the layout modification, but there were other things I know just from hearing from Chief Walsh and then eventually Chief Perkins, who passed it on to me, of stuff that they attempted to get. I know at the time the, the existing um, conditions that were in place, they were just so happy to be getting something to get them in a better uh, environment that they, you know, took what they could took what they could get, if you will. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if people remember, the uh, prior police department actually was totally housed in just where the fire department admin is now. That's All true. right. All right. So I that... do have... Oh, go ahead, Diane. I'm sorry. I just have one question. So the hazard pay with the COVID pay for both public safety departments, about how much... Are we talking? There's just there's no money attached. Yeah, so to that's it. that would be up to the uh, select board to set that. Oh, figure. Okay. And uh, various ways: bonus, premium pay, one time recognition, whatever. So that would take further okay. uh, 
talk. Thank you. And, and I would invite every select board member to visit me in my office. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. <laughs> you are welcome. Yeah. Is there bacon? <laughs> there could be. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, Steve, you want to any wrap up comments? On no, this? I, no, really. The only comment is that, you know, that concludes the, you know, the presentation. Uh, we'll be putting all of this up on um, the website as well as like more of like a uh, just a list of the projects with associated costs. Uh, keep in mind that these costs are estimated and as Rich brought up, you know, we're moving in the right direction on the, the from 500 to 350 on the town H back. But again, that's, you know, like he said, if we haven't vetted that yet we need we only have one quote and we will need to make sure that they you know come out and and uh, you know bid the job properly and it's getting done with what it is so things are things are still in fluctuation but this is really hopefully going to give us a uh, you know essentially a master list prioritized master list to work off of as we uh, we start to to get these projects underway wrap up questions or comments peter nope I'm good. Diane? No, none for me. All right. So I'll just add that um, if you haven't read it, people on the public ought to go to the uh, ustreasury.gov website and uh, read the uh, overview of the uh, final rules for the ARPA funds and understand the uh, U.S. Congress intent on this, focused on uh, economic recovery and infrastructure. And uh, we'll get the survey out. The survey is a survey, not a not a vote. And uh, we'll uh, have probably at least one, two more sessions that we need amongst the select board to uh, finalize uh, how much money on each category and uh, what particular items go through. But uh, as you saw tonight, there are a great many town needs that we need to address. All right, S Steve, do we have uh, Diane? I know the other the other presentation is ready too. Um, will we have this up perhaps right on the website along with the link maybe to the survey so that they, people can see the projects again? I don't know if there's not, you know. Yeah, yeah so we'll, 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 yeah, what we'll do, we'll create, you know, the, on the left-hand side of the website, there's a list of categories or tabs. We'll probably put an ARPA tab right at the top. And, and that will be the, you know, any material, including the link to the survey. Uh, that's related to tonight's presentation or otherwise. I can also link to the um, the federal government webpage with the final rule that uh, that Gary was mentioning, as well as a bunch of resources that the MMA, the Mass uh, Municipal Association, has actually compiled an entire page on their website just around information uh, on this on these federal funds, both CARES uh, and ARPA. So we can link all that. Well, all that will be in in that. Tab. That's, that's great, because I think the presentation was wonderful. I think everyone did a wonderful job. Um, we could just use a little bit more money. That would be helpful. Very well. Thank you for that. So, uh, Steve, uh, do we see um, anyone from the uh, Athletic Committee? Uh, I think, do you want to open it up for where we're going to? Oh, yes, yes. So, yeah, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so let's uh, take a few comments here first, then. So, um, that's uh, open to the public to uh, focus on these uh, particular items, All right? Michelle Bailey. All right, Michelle. Hi. Good evening. As you know, the um, school district has. You to identify yourself first. Uh, Michelle Bailey. <laughs> yeah, and address. Oh, to Remington Road. All right. Um, as. You are aware the school district has identified a project to revamp the elementary schools. And um, they've also identified some needs at Buker that need to be addressed. And where the ARPA funds are intended for the purpose of recovery and building or rebuilding infrastructure, I would encourage you to set aside funding to cover at least the feasibility study that um, was approved at the town meeting on this Saturday. Thank you. 
Thank you. Patrick sure. Waddell. All right. Thank you. Uh, one quick question and uh, comment. Uh, when is the spending deadline? When, uh, when are we supposed to have this money fully expended? Um, I believe it's uh, December of 25. So we have plenty of time. So there's no there's no rush to, to get this spent. My my comments are I I see three hundred thousand in revenue replacement for the town, ninety five thousand for revenue replacement for iron rail, uh, one hundred seventy six thousand for revenue lost. That seems to be going into the bank account. So I'm assuming for the town that would just go to the general fund free cash. So which is not from what I've read the real intent of our part. It's to, to kickstart projects that, that have been stalled. And I, I would echo uh, Michelle, Michelle's comments on the schools. Um, we have a project in front of us that's gonna hit the tax rate that have to, because we have this fund. And the first item that's mentioned in that ARPA document is building schools. So we're teed up and ready. Uh, we know we have an expense looming right now. So, I would uh, I would put this in the survey. Don't make it a writing. Don't make it difficult for people. Please survey. Thank you. Any other hands up there, Steve? Uh, Michelle Bailey has her hand up. All right, back to Michelle one more time. Yeah, could I just ask a question about that? I had heard, I believe at a FinCom meeting that iron rail rents were up to date and that we hadn't had losses. Have you verified that there actually have been losses? And also I had heard that there had been prior to the pandemic, there had been an anticipated loss in revenue to the town um, from people being unable to pay their taxes. But I had also heard that that had not come to fruition. So I would be interested in knowing more about what those losses were. And if they're uh, actually real. Well, yeah, the iron rail losses as stated in this presentation is the most recent number. And those are actual losses. What I don't, I don't know if you were at the FinCom meeting, but what was discussed there were the uh, FY22 uh, and FY23 up to current. And that they are, you know, those, you know, 12, 13, 15 months, they are up to date on those rents. It's the fiscal years preceding them that the loss was incurred. And you also notice that some of the tenants have been where they can making larger payments. If their rent is 2000, they might make a $4,000 payment. And that is reflected in that total. So if we got a larger payment, our revenue loss was reduced by that amount. So in fact, those revenues are for way back and so they do essentially flow into free cash if we were to use the arpa funds for that um because they're not going into you know prior well, year bills be, i know but it would yes i mean essentially yes but it would be right so it's money that would have been there otherwise so it's you're impacting the budget flexibility and the you know the ability to handle the inflation as we move forward, so it's essentially, you know, you're, you're, you have a free cash balance that's spent down significantly uh, and it allows you to replenish that. All right, anybody else with the hands? If I could say something. Go ahead, Diane. Has been um, checked by the... You're freezing up, Diane. Also say that they're all appropriate for these, these funds, correct? I think you have to repeat that, Diane. You're broken up. Yeah, I don't know what's wrong with. It. I think maybe we need a cell tower. Um, the, all of the all of these costs that we have on here have been approved as um, ARPA could be used for ARPA, by ARPA funds. Correct. Yes, the preliminary list, which included these projects that was sent by Mr. Younger uh, to Peter, our um, our independent auditor. <clears throat> Uh, you know, his opinion is that yes, they are all allowable, but we have also retained them to help us with the process as we move forward to make sure we're reporting correctly and that no expenses are taken that are not 
allowed. So it's you know, an ongoing process. That first reaction going through the list, they're all allowed. But if we get into anything that's not allowed, we obviously won't, you know, won't do it. Thank you. Anything else, Peter? Nope. Diane? No. All right. Then um, let's uh, close out this item for the evening. And then uh, do we have a speaker for the other briefing? Yes, we do. I see Michelle is in. All right. Uh, Michelle Horgan, go ahead. Great. Good evening. Thank you so much for uh, hosting us. Um, and I apologize for our late entry. Um, I want to give kudos to the select board for running a very efficient meeting. We were in a meeting ourselves, and I thought we had at least until 7.05. Um, but thankfully, someone sent us a text. So thank you for um, allowing us to present. Um, as you well know from Superintendent Tracy's presentation on um, Saturday, um, we um, have formed a Hamilton Wenham Regional School District Athletic Facility Improvement um, Project uh, Committee. And so I'm here to you tonight to present this to you. Um, as you know from what Superintendent Tracy said, um, we um, have five or four project goals. We've lost your audio, Michelle. All right. Now you're back. Um, I don't know why. I'm back now. Okay. I got her around here. So, um, as you, I'm just going to, I don't know if, if Steve, if you can share our presentation on the screen. It should be shared right now. It's up. It is up. Okay, great. Um, so as I was saying, we have project goals due to the state of our athletic fields right now. Um, four of our five of our goals are one is to bring students and events back to campus. Um, as you know that we do not have um, tennis courts currently on the campus and um, as well as field hockey um, um, is off campus and our freshman teams for soccer and baseball is off back to campus. We want to enhance our town and youth and community athletic experience. We want to relieve pressure on town parks and fields. We need to address the NEAS, which is the New England um, Association of School and Colleges, critical school facility needs, um, which we have been cited as lacking for our facilities, athletic, and our buildings. And we want to build community pride and attraction for our families in town. Um, as you can see, if we go to the project plan, it shows a new turf stadium, a new track and field, and events amenities. We have a synthetic softball field because we need to be compliant with Title IX. We have four tennis courts, which are near Project Adventure, um, but will not impact that at all. And we also have a multi-purpose synthetic track, uh, turf baseball field. And grass fields behind for lacrosse and practice fields. The Hamilton Wenham Athletic um, Facility Improvement Committee has been working with the district for the last 16 months. Um, our main purpose is to um, help the district um, offset the cost of this project. Um, we are committed to um, raising Um, and also to seek state and local grants to help source this project. Um, if you go on to the next page, it gives you a breakdown of the cost. Right now, um, the schematic design is around 75% 75, 75 um, completed. There's still some work that needs to be done, but we're working with Gale Associates who we've worked with for the past 10 years um, to give us a projection on the costs. We have added um, cost es escalation into um, the formulation given where we stand now with inflation and all the supply chain demand issues. I think you need to advance one slide. Oh, yeah. Great, 
Thank you. So what we, if, if you want to go line by line, um, we combined um, the study from 2017 and added the new um, um, configuration, the turfing of the softball field. And this also includes lights also. If we compare our school to the other Cape Ann League schools, which will be on the next slide, you can see that Hamilton, when I'm currently right now, um, aside from Amesbury and Rockport, are the only schools in the Cape Ann League without Cape Ann League without turf fields. Um, the slide shows you that Hamilton Wenham is the only school without lights. Um, and we are the, uh, aside from Newburyport, the only school without tennis courts. Um, if anyone has been paying attention to the news lately, um, infill of what you use for the fields has become a hot topic, especially with Mayor Wu uh, putting a moratorium on um, synthetic fields. We just had a meeting with Gail this evening and um, Gail is going to provide us with studies um, that really um, put people's fears um, at bay. Um, there's no correlation between chrome, uh, crumb rubber, which was used, uh, which is used as a infill and cancer. Um, there's been um, some studies done that show the impact um, of concussions um, so they're going to provide us with all those up-to-date studies. So we are aware of, of the controversy around infill, and we are prepared to address those um, issues. Um, the next slide. Um, the working group's suggested approach. Um, the Hamilton Wenham Regional School um, Committee um, moved on June 16th to continue um, the full project feasibility efforts. They are fully behind our effort which is great, which I know in years past that hasn't been the case with the school administration. Um, I think you saw on Saturday with the creation of the stabilization fund in both towns, um, the support of the district as well as the community for this project. Um, the school committee target um, of uh, 8.5 budget, not to exceed 12 to 13 million for the final estimate. Um, we as a group have um, targeted a private fundraising group of two to two and a half million dollars. We're going to be looking to state and local grants for one and a half to two million. Um, the administration, as you saw again on Saturday, is working to confirm funding capacity and options. Um, and our plan um, or the district's plan is to bring forth a full um, project to the community at the April 2023 um, spring um, meeting. Um, our next step, um, working with the school um, district, um, the school committee will formalize, this is on the next slide please, the formalized school committee support to finance structure and approach. We have created a fundraising branch of the HWA FIC and we have begun our private fundraising. Uh, we are beginning our state and local grant applications. And as you saw again on Saturday at the um, at the town meeting, we will be um, we will be keeping everyone abreast of what's happening, what's going on. As I said earlier, we do have seventy five percent complete drawings, and there's still some more work to be done. And we will continue to refine budget estimates and the timelines. Um, so again, if we look at our timeline, um, we're still working. The, or rather, the, it is the district's project, but we are, as community members, working with them. So the design, development, and level engineering will continue. Uh, permitting has been um, extended in the town of Hamilton because we had permits back from 2017, and the five-year permitting was up at the end of the month, and the town of Hamilton has renewed our permitting. Um, we did present to Hamilton um, in... Uh, August, and we thank you for allowing us to present to you now. Um, we will seek approval uh, for the project or the district will in the April town meetings. And our very aggressive goal would be to be con construction in the spring of 2024. And the project would be completed um, over a six month period, which would um, be completed in the fall of 2024. 
the goal would be um, to have our students at the high school only lose um, one season of sports. Um, if for the next slide, um, I don't know if it's, I don't think, I think we took it off of there. You know, the fiscal considerations will have to be determined um, between the district um, and the FinCons in both towns. Um, and that's where our committee would step away because it definitely is something, a, a school project that they need to work with both towns on. Um, and that is my quick presentation. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone might have at this time. Thank you, Michelle. Peter, questions? You're welcome, Gary. Uh, yeah, I have some questions. So mm -hmm. we, we were sent um, by Diana Lang um, an article about um, Ob uh, Odell Beckham going crazy uh, because um, one of his giant New York giant friends um, has a concussion issue. And mm -hmm. um, then we were also sent, I believe you guys were sent this, right? Why can't I get this to show up? It's a Boston Globe article from September 15th, and it's mm -hmm. all about safety risk as artificial turf fields wear out. It's all about uh, mm -hmm. Charlestown yep. High School. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I guess I, you know, I think as you move to our Springtown meeting, I think there are a lot of questions in here mm -hmm. that need to be answered. So, so mm -hmm. we know how much maintenance is really required. Yeah, we just, like, as I said, we were in a meeting with Gail this afternoon, um, early evening. And a lot of the issues, especially in Charlestown, um, are because they did not maintain their fields. Right. A yearly maintenance is needed every year as well. Things need to go hand in hand to secure the safety and ensure the safety of the students. Um, so the district is aware of, of the measures that, that need to be taken um, as well as our group. And we are enlisting Gail to provide us with studies and full maintenance of what needs to be done. We can't let what happened to our natural fields over the last eight years, it was a deferred maintenance. As you know, um, Diane and Peter, our children played on fields that were apart. Um, and a lot of that had to do with deferred maintenance because of money issues. We can't let that go forward, that that can't happen any longer, whether it be um, the same maintenance has to um, has to be um, be insured for the protection of our students. And so we're well aware of that. But thank you. And we will we will address it before it's tell me. So one of the things. Will someone in the background, please mute. Um, so I think one of the things that so I had a football player and a baseball player. And I know how soggy um, Patton Park is when it rains in uh, third base, right field, or left field. Um, and I don't really want to uh, get on the bad side of Reggie Maidman. But um, yeah. so what I was told is that and do you want the Patton Park will still be the preferred baseball park to play in. That is correct for varsity. It will be mm -hmm. right. Um, so, so, and I get that the the tennis court issue is ridiculous. Like I just said, mm -hmm. yes. Um, I mean that's just insane. What uh, what's being paid for tennis, and we need a new track. Mm -hmm. um, do we really need to? Um, make the softball field turf? We do because of Title IX. So the field behind, if you can look at the, I can't bring it up, but if you can look at the slide. I know what it looks like, yeah. Yep. So that is also a multi-purpose, um, baseball multi-purpose. Um, and because it's being denoted as baseball, because that is turf, softball has to be turfed. If, and I, I have to go back to the group, but if let's say we call it just straight out multipurpose, um, 
then maybe potentially we won't have to be compliant with Title IX and do the softball. But right now, to be compliant, it has to be. So I guess the only thing I would say is let's fully understand what the uh, maintenance is on these Mm -hmm. so that we don't have uh, football players getting concussions and that we also know um, when, when it's all going to have to be replaced in like 13 or whatever years. Well, you know, what's interesting is that we talked about the different infills today and most people don't use a shock pad with chrome rubber from, excuse me, crumb rubber. Um, but the group tonight said for definitely we would in, in, um, would put the extra money into putting a shock pad if we went with crumb rubber. The other envirofills, they're saying you don't need it, but we as a group said that we would definitely um, invest the extra money to protect our students and put a, a, um, a shock pad underneath the, um, the fields, whatever material we used. Um, so that was key. Um, and then we will definitely look in the maintenance. A lot of people are saying it's eight years. The warranty is eight years, but Gail is saying that if you maintain your fields correctly, that you can get 12 to 14 years out of the field if they're maintained correctly. If they're not, then it's eight years. And that's what the warranty is. But if you maintain it correctly, 12 to 14 years is the lifespan of it. And what happened in Charlestown, they weren't, they weren't maintaining it. Um, and that's part of the reason why the issue is there now. Uh, just, I, and I can't believe I'm giving you a, what seems like a hard time here, but. No, it's fine. Please so, ask so questions. If, if, if it's, um, if they say eight years and you do okay. maintenance so that it can actually last longer, um, and something goes wrong with some kid, are, is there a liability issue there? Um, I can't answer that question. Well, so but, think, it, but, think about it. Yeah, I can write, I can bring that up to him. I think if we did the, as what Gail told us tonight, is that you are, there's testing that has to be done every year to make right. sure that your fields are still um, adequately protecting your athletes. And Again, if I would think that if, and I, again, I can bring this back to Gail, if you have documentation that you're doing testing, you know, I would, one would think that that would be adequate enough. Again, the same thing if a student gets hurt on a natural turf, um, you know, it's, it's tough, but I will ask that question. All right. Sounds like you're all over it. We're trying. Thank you. You know, as, as you saw on Saturday, there's a huge community swell. Uh, for this project. Um, and just as we all know, we love this town. Um, I would love to have everyone get together on a Friday night for a football game, um, have a soccer girl soccer game on a Friday night and have my elderly neighbor come. My husband's always looking for something to do now, now that our kids are out of the district. You know, it's just, it should be a draw for everybody. Um, and it shouldn't be that once your children leave the district, there's nothing for you to do in town anymore. I re- really see this as a, a, a community builder um, and something that's needed, so. I agree. Yep. Keep so, plugging. And, yeah, we're trying. Any other questions? I know I didn't present as well as, I, as Peter Gordeaux, but, um, but I do thank you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. So just one question. What's the uh, final design or, you know, final enough to bring it to the town so uh, people can uh, have a real look at it before any town meeting? Um, you know, I'm going to have to um, check in with uh, Superintendent Tracy um, and see where he is with that. Um, more money is needed, as always. Um, but the stabilization fund does allow us to do more, to do more um, refined work on it. Um, to get it to 100% drawing. But I can ask that question of him and get back to you. Um, right, but the you. plan is to have it before town meeting so people have it available to them. Any questions, Diane? Nope, I'm good. Thank you. All right. Thank okay. you, Michelle. So if I could, 
thing. I just recap. So I will get you um, a date on when you can have um, more refined um, drawings for the town and impact on turf and the controversy that's um, that's swirling now around synthetic materials, as well as what a maintenance plan would look like. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Have a yeah. good night. All right, Steve, uh, so that uh, A, B, C done. Where are we back into the agenda order? All right, so amongst the three of us, uh, any comments from uh, special town meeting results? Diane? So I think we could do a brief recap um, of what passed and what changed and what passed. Very well. So uh, Steve, I'll uh, attempt that and correct me as we go uh, astray here. So uh, article one, which was the uh, reauthorization of the previously authorized 250,000 uh, passed really without much uh, comment. That sound right, Diane? Yes. Article two, which uh, set up the um, authorization for the school district to borrow the million dollars for the uh, feasibility study for the new uh, Cutler School uh, pass, but was separated into uh, two portions. And uh, Steve, uh, you had talked with Lauren so uh, the, the ballot vote is still on, is that correct? You're muted. Yeah, my understanding so far is, um, you know, and, and Lauren and Robin will, are gonna reduce uh, this to, write, to writing, but my understanding is that the content Contingency uh, is dropped, so the the um, you know the passage of the amendment essentially dropped the contingency of a proposition two and a half override, uh, but allowed the um, the school district to proceed with the borrowing and the feasibility study uh, with with or without the passage of the ballot question um, uh, coming up. All right. Next election. However, the ballot question is still important in that if it does not pass, then the town of Wenham does not have the option of doing a debt exclusion for that money. That's right. If it which will does make pass, it's just, it doesn't say that we are having a debt exclusion. It says that it's on the table for us to use if we want to at some point during the budget um, season to, to use a it makes it an option. It doesn't say we're definitely doing it, but if it does not pass, then we we can't. Correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah my understanding. So they have they have the authority now to borrow and proceed with the feasibility study. Those borrowing costs will be reflected in our assessment. And if the ballot question, again, in my understanding, is does not pass then those increased in our assessments due to the debt service on the Wenham's portion of the $1 million borrowing will have to be picked up through the tax levy, the existing tax levy without an exclusion. And I also, based on my understanding with Lauren's comment at the meeting that if it fails, we can still try to, we can still try for another debt exclusion Again, essentially going through this process again, town meeting vote, then a ballot question. Um, so it, you can still try again, but it doesn't, you know, doesn't, doesn't mean that the outcome is going to be any different. But so it, it means if the ballot does, if the, does not pass in November, we don't have the option to use a debt exclusion at this moment, but we don't necessarily need to put it on the tax rate if we choose to use ARPA funds for that. We are responsible for that money, but we don't have that funding source yet that right. using a debt exclusion would not be an option at that point. Well, it would be if we go forward again at the April town meeting for a uh, debt exclusion 
after the FinCom gets through the whole budget process. I am, I understand mm. all that, right. right? It's just like they they didn't vote for it, so at one point right. you just have to stop asking. Right. <laughs> all right. Thank so that was uh, Article Two Stabilization Fund. Uh, came up with uh, some questions, and I understand it was uh, much uh, more question at the uh, Hamilton Town meeting. But uh, Stabilization Fund passed, which gives the uh, the school district the ability to establish a stabilization fund which would be sourced by several different uh, possibilities, but uh, would be only spendable by a two thirds vote of the school committee, but that vote does not entail any review by the towns. So that's number three. And number four, the uh, correction of the uh, bylaw to make it more clarified, ended up with an amendment, an amendment to the amendment and the uh, Bottom line on that was the amendment to the amendment, which was uh, replacing it in full, was the uh, final passage. But that all now has to go to the uh, attorney general's office to see if it uh, actually is effective. So we wait for the AG's uh, reply on that. And uh, we heard uh, quite a bit of detail from both uh, Representative Janie Belcito and Senator Bruce Tarr on uh, what we're expecting on the wrap up from the um, current legislative session. And I think that was uh, the four articles. Anything else I missed there, Diane? No, I think you did good. All right. All right. <laughs> and we'll uh, have the, uh, the official uh, transcript, not transcript, but the uh, official minutes from that uh, prepared soon from the uh, town clerk's office. So Peter, feel like you were there now? I absolutely do. All right, good. All right. So anything else uh, from the special town meeting? Comments? No. Some. Everybody, please check your mute button. All right. Item E. Maybe there's no E. No, I, it's coming up. It's coming up. It's coming up. Can you see oh, that? That's a good one. No, it's still stuck on D. Sorry, I got so many PowerPoints open. All right. It's right. other matters. The other matters. Any other matters, Peter? None for me. Diane? Um. I don't. I don't know if this is the right time to bring it up. We didn't. We didn't do anything in particular for Indigenous Peoples Day. We did it last year. I'm not sure if it's something we need to do every day, or we just say. We've been uh, haven't heard anything from the Human Rights Committee, who has the uh, kind of the uh, task to uh, work on that. I love you. Well, that's that's who brought it yeah. to my attention because I right. I forgot about it and um i didn't you know it's next week so we're already behind but i don't know if we, it's something we should post on the website well yes yeah, so um why don't we uh post recognition for that but i don't think uh, we're in line to do an event with this uh, late entry no All right but, but maybe that we need to put that on our calendar for next year right. to make sure we're on top of all yeah. these different things Okay, uh, schedule then. Next uh, select board meeting will be the 18th of October plan back to a Tuesday night. And the following one after that is uh, will be into November. Also, uh, we have the uh, full uh, um, budget cycle schedule, right, Steve? Is that we finalized that? Yep, that's finalized. All right, so... Uh, the three of us. Could you send the, that out again? Just so yeah. I can. Yeah. Post yeah. It. Thank you. I think I have it. And I think um, no other particular events for us coming up as far as uh, outside activities like the fairs and so forth. Other than Thursday, the public forum, right? Where is that going to be? 
I think it's going to be at the Wenham Museum. That sound right? All right. <laughs> yep. We're, we're going to sound like uh, Coach Belichick day by day, right? <laughs> Do your so, job. Yes. All right. So, Steve, anything else? No, I don't have anything for you. All right, Peter. We're nope. good. So let's have the motion. Oh, All when, right. is our, when is the ATA coming? Ah, yes. So uh, our new uh, assistant town administrator starts uh, a week from tomorrow on the 11th. Oh, okay. And we'll, be, uh, we'll introduce them at our 18 October select board meeting. It's already set up. Great. Thank you. And I think, okay. Steve, uh, you were talking about uh, scheduling uh, meetings with the three of us one-on-one. -on -one with the new ATA just for hellos. Yeah, well, right, we'll do all the introductions this first. Right. Uh, this Tuesday, um, I know there's a few people that are anxious to get them on board, so yeah, but I'll, once once he gets in and settled after a couple of days, we'll, we'll get some introductions going and set up some meetings. All right, sounds good. Hey, uh, Gary, I have yes. a question for you. So you sent me the, uh, the two reports on those trust funds. Yes. I mean, I read them and, and you know, there's, there's the $5.8 million fund. And I'm not sure why you wanted me to see that, but I, the one thing I would say is, I don't think we're getting a very good return there. No, certainly over the last few years, we haven't. So I would propose that uh, as we get into the budget season and probably in November, we can uh, take a preliminary look at uh, our current investment policies and how they're being applied. So that, uh, you know, without getting into another whole discussion here. So I'll book that in probably for the first uh, select board meeting in November to have uh, the uh, investment review. Okay, great. All right. All right, so with nothing left to further discuss, I move that we adjourn the October 3rd 2022 select board meeting at 839. I second that. All in favor, Peter? Yes. Steve? Sure. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> me. Okay. Yeah, the uh, the <laughs> picture's shifted on me there. Diane and Gary, yes. Yeah. All right. Yes. Very well. And thank you thank everybody you. tonight. Uh, you know, there's a lot of effort went into doing the presentation. So we appreciate that for getting the extra information to us and we'll uh, be reaching some decisions hopefully soon. Thank you.